All right, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, just wanted to talk about some of the more uh, traditional um, early indications for cervical disc arthroplasty. Um, coming up through uh, residency where we didn't have a, a whole lot of experience with um, too much spine and definitely not the cutting edge spine. Um, there's some things that I thought were kind of truisms that maybe aren't so true these days and um, just wanted to talk about some of those things because coming from trainees, people that are newer in practice like I am, things that we may uh, think and expect uh, may not always be true, um, and just kind of show where those came from and, and uh, set the stage for some of the new things that we'll hear about later on today. Um, so again, just talking about the early development and uh, looking at some of our traditional indications and, and contraindications, um, some of the concerns that have come up, and um, also expanding use in clinical practice beyond what uh, they may have been originally designed for. So uh, disc arthroplasty, so, you know, cervical fusion is a great surgery. You know, uh, it's an interesting place to start in terms of with new technology because cervical fusion is, has great results. Um, you know, why mess with something good? Um, why try to change technology? Um, but we have always seen this adjacent segment disease. You know, it's a quoted 3% per year. You'll see um, those discs adjacent to the level fused start to wear out. <clears throat> it's kind of a known entity, but uh, for patients that are myelopathic, patient, patients with intractable radicular pain, um, having another surgery sometime down the road at, you know, 97% not going to have an ex, uh, another, another surgery is a pretty good result. But um, at, at the same time, people realize that there was room for improvement. And um, you know the, the thought of maintaining physiologic motion is something that's obviously very important for all of us, and we would hope to have that. But when we see patients, when they get to us, they're usually at some sort of deficit. And can we give that back to them? Can we keep what they have um, going forward? Uh, definitely one of the, the main goals of disc arthroplasty and something I think we've done pretty well. Um, and, and again, are we able to do that with maintaining the same sort of high standard for anterior cervical discectomy infusion that is a great surgery. So you, it's very hard to improve on something that's that good. Um, but, you know, we'll see that I, I think that we actually have, um, you know, initial studies were um, a combined cohort of radiculopathy and myelopathy, myelopathy due to disc herniation um, or compression. And pretty important to say that because a lot of these are people with not a whole lot of arthritis and uh, the degenerative disc is one that you know develops osteophytes and that's not really the population that, that these were initially tried out on um, when we see how well they do in that population I, I feel like people are expanding that but um, a lot of the early studies a lot of the data we have is on patients that are um, you know a little bit younger uh, less arthritic and mostly complaining of softer disc herniations rather than a calcified disc or a disc osteophyte complex. And uh, most of them, most of the studies are in single level disease and, you know, two, again, expanding, but has been very successful, but very limited studies on, on that cohort of patients. Some of the contraindications, um, you know, looking at arthritis, uh, you know, again, some of these may be a little bit broader than they are now, but traditionally posterior facet arthrosis, you know, if you have an arthritic joint on the opposite side of your disc arthroplasty, how much are you actually gaining from um, maintaining motion at that level? Patients may have posterior neck pain that's then continued because you're not addressing it and you're keeping the motion of an arthritic joint. Um, large osteophytes requiring resection, you know, as I said, when you're having to go down and take down quite a bit of bone, you may destabilize that apophyseal ring uh, surrounding the, um, you know, the edge of the vertebra where you're looking to gain purchase with your disc uh, arthroplasty. And if you are take, having to take down quite a bit of osteophyte, you may be putting yourself at risk for subsidence if you are a little bit too aggressive with that. And sometimes you do have to do that in order to get a good decompression. So something else to consider. Um, in the cases with instability, you know, we want to maintain uh, the motion at a segment. And uh, disc arthroplasties are, are very successful at maintaining motion. But if there is abnormal um, additional motion at that level, you don't want to use an implant that's going to maintain that. Sometimes it can be painful, especially in the lumbar spine or cervical spine as well. Um, but again, probably a patient that you want to choose a different sort of surgical approach. Infection, obviously, um, you know, using 
a, an implant with uh, poly, cobalt, chrome, titanium, these things really are uh, not appropriate in an infected patient. And in, in the elderly, um, obviously most of them do have quite a bit of arthritis, not proven in those patient, in that patient population. Uh, some I'm sure do pretty well, but um, how, how much do you want to push that indication in, in, a, in a patient population where it's not really that well studied? Um, again, these are things that we're starting to see a little bit more of, but um, not exactly proven at this point. So um, first, disc arthroplasty. Um, so the Fernstrom ball, um, 1966. These were being implanted. Um, I guess you, I guess you could call this a disc arthroplasty, but the uh, the concept was the same. So we want to maintain motion. Um, I wasn't able to find any of the cervical discs, but these were placed both in necks and uh, low backs as well, um, with the idea to restore the disc height. So you're gaining foraminal height, you're trying to decompress the nerves and also maintain motion of that disc segment without having to do a fusion. Um, very high complication rate was seen. You know, these, these balls uh, were very subject to subsidence, um, dislodging and ending up in uh, places where they weren't meant to be. So quite a long period of time um, before we started to go back and, and look at disc arthroplasty again in a serious way. Um, the uh, Cummins-Bristol is that uh, um, up here on the, on the top left. Um, and this was kind of the first one out, out in uh, the UK that was really started to, was implanted with a little bit more regularity. Um, so metal on metal, ball and socket design, uh, stainless steel, I believe. Um, and there, you know, there's not a whole lot of data out there. A lot more were placed than were actually um, followed and, and we have good data on. But there was a series of 18 patients and they had a fairly high complication rate. Um, three with screw pullout, one breakage, uh, one had subluxation. And uh, apparently all of these patients, all 18 of them, reported persistent dysphagia um, several months to years after the implant, Im implant of the device. Um, but, you know, and I, the idea was not abandoned at this point, and we can see the evolution of this same design uh, now through one of our current uh, discs down at the bottom that's uh, uh, being uh, currently marketed today. But uh, it's still an evolution of the same concept, and uh, luckily we're able to stick with it because we've, uh, we've been able to fix the problems and, and get to a much better place. Um, looking at uh, adjacent level disease, you know, the concept is that we actually have increased pressure from that fuse segment. So when we look at that, this is this is a cadaveric study looking at um, total disc arthroplasty versus um, different types of fusion. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, um, but. The thought is that if you can reduce the pressure by keeping that motion, that in initial increase in pressure with normal physiologic motion is the thing that sets you up to have degeneration in the future. So um, this looks at a cadaveric model and how, to, how we um, are actually able to maintain that motion and how we change it when we're um, doing a, a disc arthrodesis. So just looking. Um, at their, at their study design, this is a four through seven with four point fixation at both ends. Um, so again, just the limited uh, lower portion of the spine. And as, as we talked about a little bit last night, you know, those are the primary motion segments of the spine. Um, so where most of our fusions, most of our ADRs are placed. And so they focused in on this and they did the, uh, the five, six level and then looked above and below to see how much pressure. And you can see they actually tried to put these pressure sensors in and reseal them as best they could. Um, you could say that that might compromise the disc, but um, again, not many ways to actually measure this. They looked at axial, lateral, and rotational um, in all four of the states. And then we look at the, the intact, um, go back. Uh, intact spine, then they go to um, the disc arthroplasty, and then the um, just the graft alone, again, uh, not as commonly done, but in certain circumstances, uh, still done today, and then using the plate uh, in the final. Um, <clears throat> so as you can expect, um, you know, looking at axial rotation, flexion, extension, um, you know, looking at the adjacent level intradiscal pressure, and then at the intact, the um, 
disc arthroplasty is noted as PCM, and then allograft and allograft with a plate. And so looking at that specific level, um, so the, the proximal adjacent, um, adjacent level here on the side, and then the distal adjacent level here. Um, and you can see how significantly it goes up with, uh, allo so these two bars here in, in both fields um, with the allograft placement and the allograft and plate. Um, and then again, lateral bending out of the plane, um, but interestingly in this, uh, in this proximal adjacent level, so, sorry, um, not seeing that much. So the flexion extension is really the main plane where we're seeing the big difference in terms of the um, plate fixation. And so again, that may be the, the main cause of the adjacent segment disease. Um, and then looking at the full range of motion, um, kind of as you would expect, uh, axial rotation, flexion, and lateral bending with the intact spine, um, actually saw a little bit of increase in the axial rotation with the disc arthroplasty and a little bit of decrease in flexion extension, um, but significantly coming down when you add that um, hard allograft and then fix that with a plate. So continuous drop in motion as, as we can see um, through uh, cadaveric testing. And then does that in, in, uh, translate into incre increased motion in clinical practice? Because you know, cadavers are great, but uh, we've actually studied this in the actual patients as well. Um, and th these were um, straight from the uh, larger co cohort um, of, uh, of, I think, the, the initial trial. I um, see the implants as well. Um, but uh, 93 ADRs, 94 arthroplasties. Um, this is only looking at the successful patients. So it's important to note in this study, they, they removed 11 patients that did need revision, uh, whether it was um, revision with fixation, uh, transition to a uh, ACDF, or any sort of other complication. These are only the ones that went well. Um, it was a digitized evaluation, um, just, and they only looked at pre-op and two-year, and then total cervical range of motion, and then the segmental contribution. So kind of a busy slide here uh, going through all the numbers. I think it's a little bit better displayed in, uh, in this slide. So if you look at the left, uh, this is the change in percentage range of motion looking at each individual segment. So going from pre-op to two years, and if if you look here at how little that divergence is, and if you look at the actual segment, I believe that's the, the gray bar second from the bottom. So again, five sixes are most commonly, um, uh, most commonly done level for both ACDF and, and disc arthroplasty, and you can see how little that divergence is from the pre-op range of motion. And all the levels, both above and below, you see a little bit more, a little bit less, but very minimal. Um, we're talking about you know tenths of a percent of degrees of change in motion from the normal. And, and you can argue, argue that that was not physiologic motion to begin with. Uh, but again, you're keeping what the patient had before. And I don't think it's surprising to see that the operative level at the ACDF um, decreases 15 degrees. Um, you're locking that in, um, and that's well captured in, in this study. Um, but then you are seeing an increase, pretty significant increase, up to five degrees at levels above and below. And that, that change in, in the kinematics of the spine, again, we, we know that it causes adjacent segment disease, and you can see that even just five degrees of motion over time, over thousands and thousands of repetition, repetitions every day can really cause a big difference. And then just looking at the total range of motion, this shows that you actually did get a pretty significant increase at two years when you go from your preoperative to the um, total disc replacement. And Again, a lot of that's probably due to pain. People are limited in range of motion because they're symptomatic. Um, whereas you re restore the ability to move, you take the pain away, keeping the motion segment intact, you're able to restore fairly normal motion. Whereas even though patients may be, not be painful and may be very happy with an ACDF, you do take away some of that total range of motion. Um, other things, um, you know, things that I had have learned as, as contraindications were um, because of imaging. Um, all different types of metals have been used in these disc replacements from stainless steel to cobalt chrome, titanium, ceramic, poly, um, you know, all of these are 
even more coming up now as we have increase in technology in our in our materials, um, but they they all have very different characteristics in terms of imaging. And if you do have a, a patient with signal cord change or a spinal cord injury due to a, a disc herniation, things that you want to consider when you're placing one of these implants. Um, so uh, looking at this study, it was a small cohort, five patients from each. Um, and and we'll, we'll see the different implants that, that are used, but they looked at post-op MRI to see exactly how much they obscure the imaging once it's obtained. Um, they did have a scale. I think the, the pictures are a little bit more, um, uh, more telling, uh, but we can see here uh, this disc arthroplasty, um, and you can, it's a titanium-based disc with not a whole lot of metal in it, and you can see very well that it's well decompressed, there's no pressure on the spinal cord, and there's almost no artifact looking at that. Um, so if you're using this disc, maybe this is something that you could use if you were following cord signal changes. I think of patients like MS patients where they may need to be re-imaged, um, and you're not going to be compromising that uh, view of the cord if they do have uh, subsequent imaging. Uh, this is another titanium implant with a little bit more metal in it, and you can see how it does obscure. Um, you know, that looks like it may be something pressing on the cord, but it's really a metal artifact that's uh, just kind of blooming from that area where the, the implant was placed. Um, and so you may not be able to evaluate the foramina. You may not see exactly how much pressure is on the cord because you do have that little bit of artifact. And then looking at a, another type of implant that's cobalt chrome based, you know, there's very, very big shadow from that implant. Um, you can't see the cord at all in this. I've, I've seen other images uh, follow up that aren't quite this bad, but um, you know, it, it is going to sig significantly compromise subsequent imaging. And, and so uh, knowing the materials of the implant you use and the indication you're using it for, if it's primarily uh, radiculopathy, probably not a big issue. Um, but in cases of myelopathy with cord change, uh, something that you may want to steer clear of. Um, this is another thing that I was kind of uh, taught uh, coming through the orthopedic ranks, um, you know, concern of retaining motion in the setting of cord injury. Um, my, myelopathy and myomalacia is you know, kind of a miniature cord injury, bruising of the cord. Um, and if you do have a bruise, do you want to immobilize that segment? Is that going to promote healing of the spine? Um, again, something that's theoretical. I don't know that we have enough um, basic science data to say that it does or it doesn't, but um, something that is taught. Um, and you know, do we need to follow these changes in imaging? If someone improves clinically, does it matter if that bruising, if that myomalacia increases, decreases? Some people would say yes. And you know, if that's something that you do want to do in practice, um, you know, you should again look at the materials like we discussed earlier. Um, so this this was a. a Specific cohort from I think the uh, uh, first uh, Proto C study um, where they they selected out all the patients that were myelopathic. So most of the initial studies were both were for disc herniation, but a lot of them had radiculopathy. There were also some myelopathic patients as well where they had pressure on the spinal cord. So they went back through and selected those patients out and looked at those um, in an isolated subset. So uh, about 100 in each, in each group. Um, look at the patient recorded out outcomes and they had two year follow up. Um, and again, as I said, this is myelopathy second to disc herniation. We're not talking about um, degenerative um, cord compression due to osteophytes. Um, again, uh, so the, the two studies that they looked at um, go through all of these different data, um, but really the, the main point of this study is to show that there was not a big difference between arthroplasty and uh, um, arthrodesis in terms of their uh, scores. Um, you know, they, they did look at all the other things that we know about disc arthroplasty, increased motion, and um, you know adjacent segment disease requiring an additional surgery. Um, but this is the um, ODI score and or uh, excuse me SF36, um, and then you can see that there's really not a big difference between um, the cohort from and and you have to compare. So each trial here is with. Um, pre-op and at 24 months, and then again, you've got each with the 
prestige arthroplasty, prestige arthrodesis. So we know that everyone improves. Um, you know, these slight differences in um, SF36 scores from one to the other, you know, slightly better in arthroplasty kind of goes away um, in this study, but again, Everybody improves. I don't know that these studies are the, or excuse me, these outcome measures are um, sensitive enough to really capture that difference it was, if it was there. But in terms of clinical outcomes, we're not seeing that patients with myelopathy do poor, poorly because we put in a disc. Um, so again, just kind of looking at this data, in an, again, NURIC, kind of a gross measure, um, but we don't see that there's a big difference in people you know, we would imagine might get better in the short term and then get worse because there's motion there. We're not seeing that at two years. We'd like to look at this at a little bit uh, longer time point as well. Um, you know, again, long-term data continues to come out. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing about the even newer, this is, this is a, a meta-analysis from just this year, um, but it continues to support the decreased risk of adjacent segment disease, equivalent outcomes in a lot of studies, superior outcomes in many. Um, and, you know, this was the uh, five studies that had 60-month follow-up um, and, you know, pretty strong data to support that you are putting your patient at less risk for adjacent segment disease, needing more surgery in the future. Um, so definitely something you would want to consider if the indications are correct. And, uh, you know, in the future we've got, you know, new materials, improved kinematics and imaging quality with the different materials used. Um, and I think it's really exciting to, you know, hopefully have an even further improvement on something that we've taken a great surgery like ACDF and given ourselves another option where we can make it even better. And I think that we, we look to see more to come. Um, expanding indications, again, a small series that people have, have talked about it at different um, talks throughout the country, but um, people people are pushing this pretty hard. And, and I think that once we get some data to really support the increased use, you know, we may find that it, it's got an even broader um, place in spine surgery, but um, these, these are all things that, that are, are yet to be really fleshed out. So um, again, just, just wanted to uh, thank you all for coming and uh, get you started today and look forward to the rest of the talks. Thank you.